Welcome to the Take the North podcast. I'm David Hoff on the Mully and Haw Show on 670 The Score. Dan Weers from the Chicago Tribune covering the Bears. I'd like to say that we are gathering because it's an emergency podcast, Dan, <laughs> based on Justin Fields unliking the Bears on Instagram and supposedly, reportedly liking Kyle Pitts and other Falcons employees. I do not know the level of concern we should have in Chicago over such so- social media shenanigans. What say you? Well, I say that in the future, we are certain to have several emergency podcasts. This is does not qualify okay. as one of those. I spent less time on Justin Fields' perceived, purported social media activity than probably anyone in the Chicagoland area. I saw a few things in my text messages, saw a few things in my feed, and I rolled my eyes so hard that I fell into a deep sleep, and I don't know that I've woken up since. I must have misinterpreted the memo, the screaming text that said emergency pod, and I assume <laughs> that was the reason, based on the text messaging to the Mullane Haw Show on Tuesday morning, reminding me, number one, what had happened overnight. Justin Fields had unliked somebody, and number two, Asking us why we weren't addressing it with who more was, seriousness. Who was texting you? Oh, the text line. The, oh, the text texter. line. Okay. The good. audience. I, yes. Just make it okay. As long yes. as it's an audience text and not somebody that uh no we hold in higher regard. Uh first of all, I, I don't know if Justin Field, I don't know who he followed, unfollowed, is, is currently following. This was the first moment in what I would deem a, a pretty exciting time in trying to sort through all this where I was kind of done and over it and just right. like get 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 us to the finish line get us to the resolution of this get us past this inane never ending daily bickering debate I, it's, screaming it's, all of it it's like it, it's, it's it's getting to the point where the fatigue is is starting to creep up it's kind of the first step like sleeping on the couch though really i mean in any sort of football divorce you start to you start by unliking people on instagram but well okay uh, i will resist my better news judgment here and we'll get on to the real stuff so from social media the mainstream media albert breer did have a pretty interesting report over the weekend and i wanted to interpret that because all things need interpretation i think in this off season so two things stood out to me, Dan, and, and Albert Breer's report on MMQB. I think it was in a mailbag, actually, on his Twitter feed. Number one, the report that the Bears will have a quarterback plan in place by the time they get to the Indianapolis Combine next week. And number two, they began fielding trade possibilities and offers for Justin Fields at the Senior Bowl. I don't know what that means in terms of fielding offers or – talking about it it could be just loose conversation but i don't think it was anything concrete how did you interpret both of those yeah i wanted i wanted to find the exact language i don't have it in front of me as we speak here but i think he said something to the effect that 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 there were uh trade inquiries discussed at the senior bowl in mobile alabama and i think there's a very very important discussion or distinction between trade inquiries and trade offers we know the uh, uh an inquiry is notable an offer is significant you know, and so we're, so we're in the, the the phase of trying to turn notable into significant. And I don't think it would be any surprise that teams would approach Ryan Poles and his cohorts in uh, the pre-draft circuit and say, hey, what, what are you thinking? Uh, is, is Justin Fields up for trade? And if so, what, what are you guys what are you guys looking for in that regard? That's a whole different conversation than, hey, we're going to offer you a two or four and uh, listen to your counters for, for, for anything you'd want back for your current QB one. And so. Um, those conversations, by all accounts, figure to accelerate, intensify, escalate next week. Uh, at this time next week, I'll be in Indianapolis at the Scouting Combine. That's the the place where um, rumor and reality mingle, and, and a lot of conversation is had, and a lot of discussion happens. We know what happened a year ago when Ryan Poles set up shop in his hotel room in Indianapolis and started having conversations with people around the league about last year's number one pick and ultimately uh, got up in his hotel suite and, and, and began to sense uh, multiple suitors and eventually started to sense that there was a desperation coming out of Charlotte from, from Panthers owner David Tepper to find his uh, forever quarterback as soon as possible. Ryan Poles used that to his advantage and, and negotiated an incredible trade. They got the Bears a ton of that they're still cashing in on, including this year's number one pick, which they're going to be able to do more with. So anyway, that's a long roundabout way of saying that, that all of these things should become a little bit more clear or at least a little more um, advanced 
as we get into to, to the middle and end of combine week next week, as for the bears locking in their quarterback plans, that's interesting to me, David, because there's a lot more to go here in terms of their evaluation of the quarterbacks in this class, be it at the combine, be it at uh, private workouts, be it at the pro days, be it at top 30 visits at house hall. There's a lot to sift through before you lock any of those in. You're probably going to have a plan a, and then you obviously at all times during the, the off season, you need to have uh adjustability for fluidity and contingency plans ready. And I think that's all in progress right now. I, I can't believe that they would have their plans finalized by the combine. And here's why they're still going to go to a pro day. They're still going to have quarterbacks in for a visit. My sense is that they still are doing those things because they're continuing the vetting process. Yeah. You may have a plan and maybe the plan is to, okay, uh, April 10th, go to LA for Caleb Pro Day. Um, March 31st, bring it, you know, it, it could be an agenda. Right. That would, that would be fine. That would be yeah. fine. But by, I think some people have taken liberties here by saying when they say they finalize their plan, they know what they're going to do. Well, they're, so there's a couple parts to this that, that I think are worth addressing. First of all, on the on the topic of fluidity, I mean, think about what happened. I think it was either the the might have been the Wednesday morning at Combine Week a year ago, where all of a sudden, uh, just hours before Jalen Carter was supposed to step out on a podium and talk to the assembled media at the Scouting Combine, a report surfaced out of Atlanta that he was involved in a fatal car accident while uh, a player in the the Georgia program, and so all right. of a sudden. Jalen Carter's entire pre-draft process took an abrupt U-turn, you know, and it was a detour that ultimately ended in with him slipping down the draft board in a position where the Bears ultimately passed on him at number nine and traded back uh, and, and took Darnell Wright in the top 10. Uh, so that you, you always have to, to keep yourself <laughs> open-minded enough to know that there's curveballs that happen at all times of the year, and they could happen within the next eight or nine weeks. On top of that, I think you could potentially – have talked to enough outside teams to say, okay, here's what we know is on the table from interested parties as far as a trade offer for Justin Fields. Here is where our current evaluations of this quarterback class sit. Are we comfortable enough with those two things to say, hey, we're ready to go down this path and 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 trade Justin Fields away? Because look, for the Bears to get the maximum haul back mm -hmm. for Justin Fields, mm -hmm. I think that probably happens before – free agency kicks into high gear, you know, when, when you still have the opportunity to, to, to kind of dictate the price before teams are, are filling their holes and there's more suitors. The problem with that again, is it, it, it doesn't leave you a ton of flexibility unless you feel like, Hey, we're, we're fine taking any of these three top quarterbacks in this class and, and, and moving on from Justin Fields, no matter what happens. And we're willing to accept this offer and go down that direction. It's going to be really fascinating to see how Ryan eventually does this dance. Along those lines, this is the exact wording from Albert Breer in MMQB because he was talking about the timing of such things because of, let's look at the available free agent quarterbacks, Kirk Cousins, right? Russell Wilson could be out there. Right. Justin Fields would be the third. Those are going to be the big three. I, those are going to be the big three quarterbacks. So uh, Albert Breer says this verbatim. Such is the case with the Bears and Justin Fields, with the team having gotten a little insight into what his trade value may be. Chicago staffers got inquiries from other teams on Fields in Mobile. And while the Bears haven't shopped Fields, those conversations did allow the team to start to gauge the 2021 first-rounders worth out there on the market. The Bears are meeting over the next couple of weeks to finalize plans at quarterback with the expectation that they'll have the plan in place in Indianapolis next week. So be really I nice to hear that plan next week in Indianapolis. I, and for, from what we I, talked about at this outset, if we, I, if we got some crystal clear clarity at the end of February, it would really make for a, a, a much more uh, purposeful and direction led <laughs> lead up to the draft. I still would be surprised by that. Now Agreed. I think it does make sense for teams if they want to, uh, lock in and what their quarterback futures are going to look like. I think we talk about that and three teams come to mind. Obviously, the Atlanta Falcons, not just because of the 
social media activity and Instagram likes. But the Atlanta Falcons need a quarterback. The Pittsburgh Steelers have been rumored. I think that's probably a bit, bit more of a long shot. And also the Las Vegas Raiders. Although I don't know about that one because Luke Getze was introduced last Friday as the team's new offensive coordinator. And I don't think that's a marriage that they want to go down. Uh, I don't think those are uh, vows that want to be renewed either either case. So the Falcons look like the team that is most likely to be interested, but I don't, I don't know that. That's pure speculation and based on a couple of conversations with people who are speculating as well. I, are you I, talking about the same Luke Getze who is uh, the primary culprit that, that wronged Justin Fields in his two seasons with, with, with the quarterback? Is that, that, is that the one you're talking about? That, that, would, that would be the accomplice, yes. That, okay. that would be the accomplice to um, the crimes committed by the Bears' offense in 2023. I don't know how much I, what I would charge him with. Um, I don't know if he would be the primary felon, but I do think that he has received much of the blame, which is remarkable because – I Raiders. thought he was going to be in prison. I was surprised the Raiders were able to hire him, given the, the way the case was laid out against him. For so he's got many a good months. lawyer. He's, he's got, got a good lawyer. Yeah, Not only a good lawyer, he's got an agent that got him a job really quickly, despite <laughs> despite those those high crimes that you just uh, you just mentioned. By the way, quick segue or quick <laughs> quick departure. So Luke Getzey said very nice things about Justin Fields. Yeah. Uh, do you think that? He didn't have to do that. Do you think it's just because he's a professional? Because I think he, it's sincere. I, th- I, I think I think that the the this like severe fracture that was perceived by people in the relationship between Luke and and Justin was it, it's it's become incredibly exaggerated uh, based on conversations I've had with people across the building at Hallis Hall uh, that have been there in the last year. The other part of this is uh, you know Colleen Kane did a really good story. Uh, leading up to Justin's home finale, uh, right before New Year's Eve, where, where, where Justin, I, I don't have it in front of me, um, but but Justin had one of the most telling quotes of of all the telling quotes of the entire 2023 season when he said, sometimes Luke calls bad plays and they don't work. And sometimes Luke calls good plays and I make mistakes and they don't work that way. And so we're both at fault and we, we, we're both responsible for the struggles of this offense. And I'm paraphrasing here, obviously, but it was, it was along the lines of that, where it was, it, it was a very grounded and reasonable um, admission and acknowledgement of what, the situation was for the bears in 2023. And so when Luke speaks highly of Justin, I think he had great admiration for all the things that we've expressed admiration for his ability to come to work, his ability to reset his ability to lead a locker room, even when his own play wasn't at its highest levels. There's a lot of things to like about Justin Fields. Luke gets, liked a lot of those things. And now it's, it's time um, for Luke to start new in Las Vegas. And to yep. your point, as you rattled off some of those other teams, um, I think it's time for Justin to start anew with a new coordinator somewhere else. And so, David, you essentially named three teams. The Raiders, we're both sitting here with an educated guest saying, cross them off the list. And then that's the Steelers and the Falcons. Well, the Falcons, being from Justin's home state and having this full uh, offensive roster of weapons seem appealing, but they also hired Zach Robinson to run their offense, who's a disciple of the the Sean McVay tree, which has been an offense that the Bears tried running with Justin Fields, and it didn't quite work because Justin's skill set doesn't quite marry up with the things that that offense asks the quarterback to do to produce at a high level. And so that's something that has to be taken into consideration. Will Zach Robinson show great adaptability and flexibility if he wants Justin Fields to change the entire roots of, of what his system is, or will he say, look, like I've watched the tape and I see that there are flaws within Justin's games that don't translate to what we want to do offensively. And the Falcons say, we'll take a pass at which point this game of musical chairs that we're talking about gets a little more complex. And I think that's going to be fascinating here in the coming weeks to see who has chairs available and how quickly Justin's able to sit down in one of those chairs. It's a really good point about Zach Taylor. And I'm not saying you're doing this, but I do Zach think Robinson. That- I'm sorry, Zach Robinson, yeah. Zach Robinson uh, and the McVay influence. I do think that we tend to overstate and want to make the perfect fit with player and scheme or coach uh, and scheme. And we marry those two things together so tightly because if I'm Zach Robinson and I'm looking at a uh, tape of Justin Fields and I'm looking at tape of Desmond Ritter or I'm looking at tape of another free agent quarterback who we may or not, may not be able to afford or, or get, I can learn to love Justin Fields. And I think coaches do that all the time. And I think players learn to adapt. Now, is it going to be perfect? Probably not. 
you're never going to have the perfect marriage between skill and scheme. But I do think you're going to have probably a coach in Robinson, much like the, the situation in, in Chicago. Let's face it, the, we don't know yet uh, if Justin Fields is going to be going or staying. But if he stayed, hypothetically, Shane Waldron could coach Justin Fields well. And I, I don't. I think we tend to sometimes over, overstate how how much those two skills – there's two things have to be married together. If you have a dynamic player who's going to be progressing and maturing and, and improving, then I think that you can find a good play caller to take advantage of those. Skills. You can you can try. You can try. You can certainly try. But I, I do think that the marriage of system and, and skills is is paramount in this league. And and you know, Justin has things within his games, whether it's the inability to make anticipatory throws, whether it's the inability to do things quickly, make decisions quickly you know, even just the mechanics of his delivery, speeding that up to a way that, you know, we watched it, David, in week 18 up at Lambeau Field where Jordan Love, it's just bang, bang, you know, see it, throw it, uh, get the ball, make some of these quick game throws, be able to do things at, at, a, at a quickness that allows you to have success. That's paramount in the McVay system. It's just absolutely paramount. And if Justin can't do that, well, now you're devising an entirely new offense around him, which somebody may want to do. And we'll see which direction it goes to, to the concept of this musical chairs. You named Cousins, Russell Wilson, and, and Fields as three of the headliners in the game of musical chairs that's going to be played around uh, the NFL. You all, you can throw in Baker Mayfield in that list, though. I fully expect him to, to re-sign in, in Tampa. Ryan Tannehill's going to be floating out there. Joe Flacco may be interested in, in getting a job somewhere. I don't think he'll be signed as a starter, but certainly a guy that will be out there to be had. You add in Caleb Williams, Drake May, Jaden Daniels, Bo Nix, Michael Penix, J.J. McCarthy, all of a sudden we're up to 11 names, right, of, of, of guys who are potentially in the party room to play the game of musical chairs. And then you go down the list league-wide of the teams that are absolutely 100% going after a quarterback in this cycle, you know, between free agency and the draft and trades. And all of a sudden you go, okay, well, where does this all stop? Like somebody's going to be left out when, when the music stops. I'm not saying it's going to be fields. I'm not going to say it's going to be saying it's the bears, but when you talk to people around the league right now, there is not a robust market of teams that are going to be charging out the front door of their facility and banging on the hotel room door of Ryan Poles next week to go, we got to have Justin tell us what you need for him. And so that's going to be just a dynamic that people have to be aware of as Ryan tries to make the best decision going forward. So before we get into some of the contract dynamics as well, which will be considered and need to be addressed, what would be your projected timeline for a Justin Fields trade if you had to guess right now on February 20th? I mean, look, like I, I again, if you're Ryan, I think the ideal world is to try to get it locked in before the new league year begins and, and, and just get that box checked and try to get something back that satisfies you before teams start having the option to explore all these other things. You know, if, if teams start to become enamored, like where are the Steelers drafting? 20th? They're down a little bit. The Falcons are a team that's picking eighth. Right. Why would the Falcons commit to Justin Fields when they could sit there on March 12th and say, you know what? We want to see if J.J. McCarthy falls to eight. We want to see if a Drake May slips down potentially to five, right? And then all of a sudden we can make some calls up and use our draft capital to go up to five and get Drake May on a rookie contract with 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 great enthusiasm about doing so. This is something that that has to be taken into consideration because you know there are teams that I think are going to want to get involved in in this talent rich quarterback draft class to try to make their hay that way and and so for some teams it may be I'd prefer to wait until later in April for Ryan I think the ideal world would be to get this done before free agency begins I won't be surprised if they have to wait I won't be surprised if they do wait I think it may end up playing out that way just because of supply and demand and a lot of teams who might not understand yet what they want or how much they're willing to spend. Okay. So let's talk about the contract situation that you wanted to get into with Justin Fields and some of the misunderstandings or maybe things that we need to know moving forward when we're still considering uh, whether or not the bears should or shouldn't or will or won't move on. So I gave you and Adam Studzinski, our stud producer, pardon the pun, a homework assignment before this podcast, because I put out a tweet, over the weekend, and I'm going to read it verbatim so that our audience has a, a better understanding of kind of what I was after and how many people failed this exercise. Uh, <laughs> the tweet was this, you're Ryan Poles. You're weighing the possibilities of keeping Justin Fields. You are starting to think about his contract situation beyond 2024. 
your move. What is it? So I asked you guys to, to, to find the responses, which by the way, as of this taping, uh, I think, let me see how many, how many, uh, responses we had 388 replies to that. Wow. <laughs> I, I, asked, I asked each of you to try to find two that you deemed sensible so that perhaps we could filter through some of the noise and the mess to come up with a logical uh, discussion on why the contract situation provides a really good frame for this discussion. Uh, a lot of people had a lot of thoughts. Um, a very small percentage of them were able to handle the actual assignment, which was to address the contract situation of Justin Fields, not just shout at other people in the thread about whether they like Justin or dislike Justin. I picked the first two that made me nod my head in agreement. I don't Perfect. know how studs went about it. How did you do, Adam? Adam can go okay. first. So I had – this This was fascinating because I looked through quite a bit of these replies trying to find something that I thought made sense. Most of it, most of it was just trade fields or keep – like I, there was a lot of keep – was stunning to me. Uh, here's what I found. And so this guy is saying – right, Ryan Poles – He's basically quoting, quoting Eric. Whom Justin Fields is worth six million dollars this year. I could take a twenty-two million dollar fifth-year option, and is likely worth thirty-five million a year for the four to five years after that, assuming you do it. Right? Or I could have Caleb Williams at six million dollars this year. He's worth eight, ten, and twelve for the years after that, approximately. Right, whatever the rookie quarterback structure comes out to be. That one I actually found sensible because that actually accomplished, like followed the assignment. It's like, okay, you were asking about the contract talks. Like this, this is what you're looking at. So that was that was the first one I found. It was really hard to find anything else, to be honest with you. <laughs> okay, a lot of mine were like, why is Dan so grouchy? Uh, <laughs> why does Dan hate Twitter? Why does Dan make fun of me and my social media feed all the time? Why doesn't Dan sound happier on the radio? <laughs> I'm coming, just kidding. I, they're all I'm, coming at me. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay. You know what? Andy O'Halleck, at A-O-H-A-L-E-K. This was the most sensible one I think I found, and I went through a bunch, probably more than I should have. It was a rabbit hole that you just kept on going deeper. You know all about that. Yes. This is, this is what Andy said. Trade fields, drafts QB, cannot, all caps, cannot pay a dude $25 million plus for bottom 10 play at that position. I honestly believe CW, Caleb Williams, and Drake May's floor is higher than the production we saw last season from Fields. The amazing OMG plays don't outweigh the layups JF1 misses or doesn't see. That's a very good tweet because it's not personal. It, I keep I always say this. It, it's not criticism. It's objectivity. And the wow plays, the special flashes – they really don't outweigh the yards that are left on the field. In my mind, in Andy O'Halleck's mind, and I think that's a sensible way to look at what what are you investing in potentially. Well, you're investing in the highlights. You are buying a movie ticket based on the trailer. And I just don't know if that's always the wisest way to go about it. So Andy O'Halleck is the tweeter of the day. I have one more. Bob Soda, S-O-D-A. Do you know Bob? I picked this one too, David. <laughs> okay. Thank God these Twitter replies aren't Ryan Poles. I've never seen a fan base so dead set on remaining mediocre at the most important position in sports. <laughs> it's Welcome well to Chicago. <laughs> but my purpose in, in, in putting this out there over the weekend wasn't even to, to – draw the conclusion that the tweets that you guys just mentioned all drew. It was to say, if you wanted to keep Justin Fields, how would you do it? And so few people could come up with a clear, coherent answer on how to do it rationally. One of the most common responses was to um, eschew the fifth year option and try to do what the Packers did with Jordan Love, which was to give him an extension that guaranteed him less money in year five, but was loaded with incentives so, so that he could play out his rookie deal and then play in 2025 with an incentive-based contract. Justin Fields is not, even though he's re represented by the same agent as Jordan Love, isn't going to accept that deal. Jordan Love had made one start in his career when he 
agree to that extension. It was a, a, a prove it kind of scenario that the Packers put him in. Just Justin Fields is 38 starts into his NFL career. There's no way he's going to take less than the fifth year option to try to plan a, a, a prove it deal in 2025. Beyond that, almost nobody. I, I don't know if you could go through almost 400 replies in that thread and find anyone that thinks Justin is worth more than the $160 million Daniel Jones extension from a year ago. Nobody's advocating extend him for, for multiple years down the road and, and pay him at least $40 million on average. And at that point, you're drawing your own conclusion that you don't think Justin Fields has proven himself better than Daniel Jones at this point. And if that's what you're advocating sticking with is somebody that you're not confident enough is as good as Daniel Jones to be paid like Daniel Jones, your conclusion's being drawn for you. The other most popular response was the one that is almost so far out there that it's not possible. It's to uh, make him play out year four of the rookie deal, exercise the, the, the fifth year option, and then franchise tag him. So just oh my gosh, three, three years on your term. So so you create another three year runway of trial to figure out whether Justin is your long term answer at quarterback because three years and thirty eight starts wasn't enough. Let's do three more years and thirty eight more starts, and then we'll figure out whether we want to pay him. When here you are sitting on the doorstep of a potential upside beats everything opportunity to draft Caleb Williams in a draft that isn't going to come around every year, even though some people want it to. Uh, and, and, and so like, it was just crazy to, to, to go through all those responses and struggle to find even a dozen that made a coherent argument for how Justin could stick here business-wise. It's all emotion driven, you know, it's all emotion driven right. on, we love Justin. We don't want to see him go. Caleb uh, Williams fans can go to hell. We want Justin, keep him here. And that, that's, that's what it's flooded with. What you do the business exercise as an NFL general manager and you go, there's no way this can happen. The business exercise would also include, okay, arguing on behalf of the Justin Fields crowd for a moment. Yeah, I'm, that, that's the, part of the exercise. The, the fact, the fact that. that if you if you did say one of your uh, suggestions or one of the alternatives in, in paying Justin through five years and, and not necessarily extending him, which I think is impractical and not unlikely, but theoretically it would allow you, not necessarily, it would eat up money that you could spend on other resources which is the beauty of the rookie contract which is right. what the Caleb Williams crowd will argue but the counter to that is well you won't need to spend the money on all those assets because you have all those draft picks and all that young talent and it's going to be rookie talent that's going to grow and Justin Fields is going to be good enough at quarterback to get you more players that are on cheap contracts that is a better use of your resources so I think that that is the counter to it I don't necessarily agree with that but I do think that's what you hear sometimes when people are arguing to keep Justin. Studs gave some of the numbers from the, the Caleb Williams rookie deal. And when you when you look at what the sa the savings won't come in 2024, so it won't be this year. It'll be 25 and 26. Uh, and then if Caleb materializes into what you think he's going to materialize into, you're extending him after his third season and you're giving him one of those, you know, record challenging, record setting quarterback deals. But you're going to have in 2025 and 2026, if you use that Daniel Jones contract, as a baseline, you're going to have 30 plus million dollars in savings in those two, you know, league year uh, roster cycles to go sign people to go get somebody that can fill out your roster by 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 this time next year, the Bears should conceivably be in a position to be making a strong charge at playing deep into January. And at that point, you want to have some extra money to make some of those luxury signings that, that hopefully push you over an edge. And you're going to have that in 25 and 26 if you have a rookie quarterback's contract as opposed to a, uh, a middle-tier guy who you're paying $40 million plus a year. It was a fun exercise. It was a good, worthwhile thing to do. One last note on, on, on this before we move on to another topic. We mentioned Daniel Jones several times. Just worth noting, <laughs> the last mock draft I saw had the Giants taking a quarterback with their Jane first Daniels. pick. The, yeah, Jaden Daniels. The the scuttlebutt from the Four Letter Network had Mike Tannenbaum, former general manager, suggesting, I think, that the Browns should trade Deshaun Watson for Daniel Jones and swap <laughs> bad contract for bad contract. I don't think that would ever happen. The point being that the Daniel Jones contract is used and referred to so often because it's a mistake. Yeah, it was a colossal error and a bad judgment on behalf of the Giants. So. I don't know if 
you know, it, when you hear that reference in relation to Justin Fields, it's like that is what you want to avoid. Right. And, and, and at the same time, David, people aren't even willing to go as far as saying that that Justin Fields is worth the deal that, that Daniel Jones got. And so it's a it's a quick, hard pause when, when you get to that point of the, the financial negotiation standpoint of this. Um, look like we're going to get a chance this week, presumably to hear from Shane Waldron at Hallis Hall next week at the Scouting Combine. We're going to hear from Ryan Poles. We're going to start to have inside the building chatter coming out that we can uh, dissect and interpret and analyze. And and maybe uh, Ryan Poles next week will give us his interpretation of, of Justin's Instagram follow. Excellent. I just, uh, go ahead. I throw out one more tweet that I wanted yep. to make sure that we we, we get, on, get on this before you guys move on. This is from uh, Felipe, I believe you would pronounce who this was a quote tweet so i went so deep on this i went into the quote tweet i love it <laughs> and uh so this he perfectly summed this up so, uh, he said lol this tweet specifically asked about his contract it's like applies three of them have contract in it y'all just like to argue <laughs> <laughs> that's true i may have i may have hearted that when i saw that one over the weekend i know i saw that over the weekend i was like god felipe is the only one that's listening uh, as he reads the tweet out loud to himself and realizing how many people are failing at the actual point of it, which is why I've been lobbying um, for many years now. This is a, a cause of mine that we've never gotten off the ground for a separate social media platform where we filter out the idiots. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> We welcome the debate, though. We love the conversation because it keeps us going. Last quarterback uh, note before we end up with a, a stadium update. Um, what did you think quickly about the um, Daniel Clatt? Uh, wait. Uh, Joel Clatt. Joel, I'm sorry. Yeah, Joel Clatt. Joel Clatt's ranking of the quarterback prospects. Joel Clatt, the, obviously the analyst for Fox, been doing this a long time. He had Caleb Williams rated the number one quarterback of all the quarterbacks that he has evaluated pre-draft since 2012. Yeah, I mean, it's um, eye-catching. It's attention-grabbing. It's not um, outside the box, though, from what you're hearing from people around the league. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's it's high praise because he had, 2012 he, was the, the Luck Griffin draft. Yeah, he had, he had Caleb Williams, Andrew Luck. Third was uh, Trevor Lawrence. Fourth was Joe Burrow, and fifth was a mistake in Bryce Young. Yeah, so obviously it's a uh, yeah, ahead of the curb on on Joe Burrow. If you're if you're winding up with Joe Burrow here, and I I know that he he had to clarify that, that this was just as prospects. It's not with the benefit of hindsight in in saying, oh yeah, we knew so and so was going to be because uh, it doesn't include the Mahomes. Draft. He may have had Drake May in there too. I'm sorry, he might he might have had Drake May. Uh, in that list, in that top five, which which was very very interesting too, because of all the respect he seems to be gathering. But but I mean, look like the the one thing that has been consistent with people I've talked to over the last five or six weeks is that the upside of Caleb Williams is undeniable. Now you have to find a path to get to the upside, right? And you have to make sure that you don't derail that along the way. And that's why organizational health and infrastructure and all the things that we talk about uh, ad nauseum repeatedly on this podcast are, are so very important, but it's the, the upside and the potential, everyone sees it, you know, and at that point, like you cannot talk yourself out of that when you're in a situation like the bears are in, you just have to go after it. And then ultimately you have to, you have to be very cognizant of all the things that you need to line up around the upside to make sure that the upside continues going up, you know, and that's something that this organization has failed at repeatedly over time, uh, whether it be with Mitch, whether it be with Justin, whether it be with people before that, you would have more experience to talk about Jay and uh, Rex and, and Cade McNown and anybody else. But uh, you know, that's something that's very, very important is to understand that it's one thing to pick the quarterback. It's another thing to see through the development in a way that takes them to the upside that everyone sees. Last thing I think we need to touch on is uh, an update on the stadium project with the Bears in Arlington Heights and the South Lot and wherever else they choose to look. So over the weekend, as we sit here on Tuesday afternoon, uh, news broke or the deadline passed. The Chicago Bears and three suburban school districts were unable to reach a deal on the value of the team's Arlington Heights property by Saturday's deadline sending the dispute back to the Cook County Board of Review to make a decision that could have major implications for the team's future in the northwest suburb. That's according to NBC5. It was reported everywhere. It is now entered into evidence as a missed deadline. <laughs> I 
I don't know what to expect next on, on what is going to happen. The Bears obviously bought the property for $197.2 million in February 2023. This is the only thing I want to think is worth worth mentioning. I do wonder if Kevin Warren is playing a dangerous game here. And he knows what he's doing. He's done this before. He has reminded us several times that he's done this before. I don't think the Arlington Heights people, I don't think the Cook County uh, uh, assessors valuation, I don't think these school districts are messing around. And I don't know if they're going to come down. I don't think they're going to compromise. And I think the Bears have more to lose here than, than, than the school districts feel they do. I also know that Kevin Warren has talked about the South lot and the beauty of being on the lakefront and in the city of Chicago. I don't know how much of that is leverage. I don't know how much of that is reality. But if that is a realistic, viable possibility that he considers for the Bears, better move quickly there too. The point is something better happen fast. Yeah. Because the White Sox, Jerry Reinsdorf appeared in Springfield uh, in front of the legislature on Tuesday to lobby for a billion dollars in subsidies to help them build at Clark and Roosevelt in the South Loop. Now, they're going to tap into some Illinois Sports Facility Authority money that isn't going to be eligible or available for both the Sox and the Bears. We've talked about it before, the virtual race between Kevin Warren and Jerry Reinsdorf. Meanwhile, there's stuff going on at Arlington Heights. The one thing that you re- want to remember, or at least I thought find myself remembering today as we talked about this with somebody else, Ted Phillips always made the McCaskies money. Always made the McCaskies money. He was unpopular. He was polarizing. He was not a football guy. He was this. He was that. But he was always the team president because he made the McCaskies money. The Bears embarked on this project, the stadium project. Why? Initially, primarily, they wanted to own their own stadium. Correct. That's how you make money correct? for your owner. That's how you make money in the NFL. You might not be the perfect scenario initially. It may not be the price you want to pay uh, at the outset, but you know what? They may have to bite the bullet if they want to accomplish what the primary goal always was. Own your own stadium, print your own money, build a football mecca, and invite everybody to the party. I don't know if they're going to be able to do that, if they continue to be so stubborn. And I don't know if the alternative on the South lot is going to be there for much longer. It's a very dangerous game they're playing. It bears watching, no pun intended, and it's worth updating and keeping an eye on. If I'm correct, by the middle of this week, they should have a decision from the Board of Review on on the Arlington Heights reassessment, correct? And in, in, in trying to get um, – some some form of leniency. Maybe there. that was last week that it passed. That was last week when they were informed that the Bears uh, that they had a difference of opinion in the value. So the Saturday deadline, nobody quite knows how to make of the the passing of a deadline without an agreement. Yeah, and I, I do think there will be something that comes this week in terms of of whether that that will be reevaluated or at least allowing the school districts and the bears to come to uh, a, another talking point where they can. The board of review is expected to reach a decision on the value next week. The biggest thing going forward here is to understand what you said, that that if, if you are able to make things work in Arlington Heights, which has been the, the vision from, from day one, you're able to open up revenue streams like fire hydrants out there. You know, and you're able to to create what you're talking about is, is that profitability and that money that that helps you do a lot of other things. I still haven't heard anything in the grand visions downtown and in the city that that logistically makes any sense to me in terms of where you're going to put it, how you're going to fund it, how you're going to get it going quickly. Because to your point, Kevin says repeatedly, time is money. And the more you delay on these things, the more the cost of the things that you need to build a stadium go up. Um, so this is a, a period where, where they're very well aware that this thing's got to get urgent and it's got to accelerate quickly. And hopefully they, they find themselves in what you deemed stadium races last week, uh, and a, a victor, you know, and an ability to get to, to a spot on the track that allows them to proceed in a way that, that furthers the strength of the organization right now, it feels like there's a lot of, um, tires spinning in the mud and, and it, it's hard to, to know if there's a tow truck nearby to get it out of the mud. Cook County Board of Review is expected to reach a decision on the value this week and then sent to the assessor's office for certification. 
once it is certified, if they have not reached a settlement at that point, the Bears could appeal to the property tax appeal board or they could file a complaint with the Circuit Court of Cook County, which would make it very fascinating theater. Either way, not a great outcome for the Bears. They want to settle this. They want to move on and they maybe want to bite the bullet. So we'll keep an eye on that moving forward. Um, good points on that. Uh, last thing we need to mention, Dan. We're going to do mailbag later this week. So you can tweet at us at at take the North pod on X or Twitter. You can tweet at us individually. If you wish, you can send us an email at our email address. I believe we have an email address that is uh, take the North pod at gmail.com. Gmail.com. I believe take the North pod at gmail.com. I thought you had that memorized. I do have that memorized. I have a lot of things I'm trying to memorize this week. Um, and then we'll get to uh, get to all of it. Anything else that we forgot? Yeah, we've teased for a couple of weeks that we're expecting to hear from the new coordinator, Shane Waldron and Eric Washington, soon. It's my understanding that we should hear from them this week. Still waiting on an official day and time on that. But I think before we go to Indianapolis, we'll have some thoughts and some sentiments from Shane Waldron and Eric Washington, which will be good to uh, kind of advance the discussion here of what's going on with the Chicago bears, what they're doing on both sides of the ball and what direction things are headed. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. I just don't know when it's actually going to come to become a reality, but it should be this week. So that's my last tease. That will be a welcome contribution to the conversation. We'll look forward to talking about that when they do speak. And we will be right here on your free Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. It's take the North. You can watch us on the 670 Scores YouTube page, and you can listen, you can download, and you can subscribe and let us know what you think of the Bears this offseason and what you think about what we think of the Bears this offseason. So for Adam Stadzinski, Dan Weeder, I'm David Hall. We'll talk to you next time on the Take the North podcast. Great talk. See you out there.